So, um, sorry, I mean, I, I just went with, 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 could you put it in my ball? I'll do one to you. Yeah, just, 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 just put it in there. Thanks a lot from the water fountain. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so I uh, wanted to, to hit um, before lunch uh, some aspects of, of study management and operation, okay? A um, couple, couple notes here. Ethica is an incredibly flexible system. And if we think about a study underway, um, it provides you many tools that that uh, can in fact be adapted as we learn from the study. And that's very powerful. We learn um, about what works better and there's an opportunity to change it. Just be aware that when it comes to changing a study, while it's technically quite readily doable, while we can, we can push out new notifications, or excuse me, push out new uh, survey instruments to people. We could change the freq of what data streams are collected. We could, um, we could change the background image that's used. Um, thanks a ton, much appreciated. Uh, grateful for that. Um, uh, just be aware that in so doing, there are risks. Um, and one of the risks, um, uh, is to analysis power. I mean, you, you change the study, and so in terms of analyzing the findings from the study, um, you may have switched to a new configuration, and you, you're going to have data from the old configuration, data from the new configuration, um, and you're going to have less data from the new configuration than if you had stuck with it from, from the start. You also have to get ethical approval for the change, the change in protocol, and that may raise some challenges. But um, one of the issues that people overlook, but it's a very important issue, and it's a reflection of the current technical state of Ethica, maybe it will evolve over time, is that um, recall that one of Ethica's foremost strengths as a platform is that um, uh, people, it does not in any way contingent upon, its operation is not contingent upon, it doesn't depend on uh, a person's connectivity with with uh, the internet or with, with Ethica servers. The person doesn't have to be online. The person could be offline. They could be on a canoeing trip in northern Saskatchewan. They could be, um, uh, they could be engaged in uh, activity in a rural area where you know, there's not good cell phone service or Wi-Fi available. Um, and uh, as a result, participants only upload data occasionally, um, uh, catches catch can, and it can sometimes be time. Even if you're with a cell data plan, it may be a couple days um, between times you get, uh, in rare cases, where you get data uploaded. Um, equally much so, although Muhammad didn't emphasize it, um, a very important element of ethic is the fact that when it uploads data, it also will check for updates to the system uh, on an occasional basis. And if you go to your, your Ethica system here, um, and uh, I'm gonna call it up here, and I'd invite you to do your same, do the same, for those of you with the phones out there. Okay, here we are, right? Here's, here's Ethica, this is one of 13 studies I'm part of, or what have you. Looks like I have a, a survey to fill out for, okay. Um, but if you go in the upper right, there's a little gear-like thing. It looks like a gear um, uh, and on the upper right. And if you press that, now some of you with the really small phones might see dot, 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 and you have to press that, okay, with the S3 minis. But if you press that little thing in the upper right, if you press the dot, 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 you may have to choose settings or something. But this one, do you see this screen? It looks something like that. Okay, now notice on the screen a bunch of, of options. Um, some of them are germane to what we've already been talking about. Upload via Wi-Fi only, for example. If, if you, um, on a per study basis, you could set it, do I upload under, uh, you know, by, by Wi-Fi only, or also we'll consider cell networks. Um, there's some additional things here, but one of them is reload configuration, okay? That actually reloads the configuration of the system from the server. But what's, what's hidden is that you can press that button and it will refresh the configuration. If you added a new survey, 
you know, a few minutes ago, you could press the button to see it on your device. But beyond that, in the background, Ethica is automatically checking for updates. How often does it check, Mohammed? Can you speak to um, that? It actually does, does not, uh, well, if I want to correct that, uh, it doesn't automatically check for updates, but as soon as something changes, I think we saw that yesterday, that there is a button on the website that says synchronize with the phone, yeah. and that sends a message, that sends a request to the phone to do the synchronization. The we next time it's connected. No, well, yeah, yeah, the next time it's connected. We tested it yesterday. I originally had created a survey with a uh, a question that was supposed to be enabled but, but was disabled, yes. but then I changed that to enable and I sync, uh, I pressed sync with device and that device started to receive the changes that we had made. Uh, this uh, has exactly the same functionality what yep. you showed on the app. It's yep. just if you, if you prefer to use it this way or if you, as I said, like there's a, there is a certain situations that the message is not delivered or you it might deliver a bit later, like in a few minutes, and you want to do it right now, right. you press that. But yeah. usually for the studies that are in the field right now, the best is to just go to the website, you press that, and yeah. participants receive it. So uh, you don't have to ask them to do anything. Right. One thing to bear a note, though, is if someone is offline right now, they may get it tomorrow or yes, the next if time. They're, if they're offline, they won't be able to, if they press that, they won't be able to receive the data because there is no internet connectivity. There. Exactly, Yes. exactly. Um, and, and that message won't reach them for asking Ethic on their device to refresh itself for potentially a day. And because of that, um, you know, participants get access to updates only over time. It's not necessarily an instantaneous thing that you refresh the study and you changed it and they immediately get it. And right now, there's not metadata stored, you know, with, with respect to each piece of data that you get. It doesn't record, you know, which version of the survey was this with, or which um, which version of the app was this with. Um, and uh, there can be some reasoning you have to do with, okay, were they seeing this um, through the updated system or the system before the update? Now, remind me, Mohammed, when someone's phone uh, reports uh, survey results, okay? So I filled out a survey, I, I, I fill it out, and that gets uploaded eventually to the server. Does that actually include within the text, the questionnaire, uh, the, the text of each question? It does. Yes. So, so that, if I change survey wording, um, that will be reflected, uh, I could tell from from looking at that JSON file, that, that file of information, I could tell, oh, this is with the old survey, this is with the new one, Correct. for those responses. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, good. Um, okay, some barriers, uh, barriers to uh, retention. Okay, so during, during a study, we will lose people sometimes. Um, let's talk about a few of the major barriers, and this is, uh, uh, this is something where I'm sure Kevin and, and Muhammad could could uh, chime in quite a bit. Um, um, why do people leave the study? Why do they drop out uh, of a study? Um, one issue that we've encountered when recruiting networks is, well, if a network contact or required network contact drops out. So if we're recruiting an ego and their alters, the, the value to the study um, is secured through tracking contacts between the ego and alters, and if the ego drops, then the alters essentially may have to leave the study. In other cases, people might change phones, and they don't lead, they don't, they don't load Ethica onto their new phone. That's a risk, too. Um, and you could chase them down um, to try to get them to put it on there, but that is a, a barrier to retention. You have to undertake active work. Um, in some cases, app concerns could lead to uninstallation of an app. And we've found at least the footprints of this before. Um, um, Mohammed, do you know of any cases where you have definitively been sure it's due to uninstallation? I'm thinking there's cases which very likely was. But, but we can't say for sure because we... Well, everything unless stops. someone told, to, yeah, unless you know, unless Carmenza called them. Yeah, unless they call and say that, so yeah. yeah, unless they call and say that they did uninstall the app. Exactly. Well, we did get an email from someone that says that, well, 
Previously, the way that survey was working was that it was just beeping every five minutes until you answered, and yep. I actually drove someone crazy and just emailed us that this is nuts, so I'm just going to uninstall it, and I'm never going to install it back again. So, <laughs> so that way we know that they uninstalled. Right, and, and <laughs> right now Ethica is, 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 is not um, accompanied by that feature, is it? No, well, that was <laughs> one of the things that we excluded it from the feature list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, uh, change in contact information, the person goes missing, you know, they move somewhere and, and you don't know where they, uh, uh, where they are and they're, they're not responding. And overage challenges, you know, if, if people find that they're exposed to costs because of the study, they could grow, um, they could grow quite unhappy in a way that might, uh, might impair their retention. What other, um, Kevin and, and, and Mohammed, what other sort of barriers or what other triggers are there to non-retention in your experience? Um, I, I mean, privacy concerns are there below the surface, but I don't know, I can't remember anyone who actually lacked uh, concern. But, but yeah, are, there, are there other barriers to retention that you I can? I think the bigger one is more uh, data quality. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and we'll come to that. But, but in terms of just kind of dropping out of the study altogether. I think once in a while people figure out that, oh wait, this is spying on me and I don't want to have this. Mm -hmm. It's very rare, but it does happen. And once in a while the, the um, burden of answering the questions becomes. Yeah, the question. Oh. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I wanted to like that. just simply don't answer. Well, sometimes I've had people say, you know, I've had, well, one. <laughs> Person makes it say I got tired of answering these questions over and over again. I'm just going to do this before. Yeah. 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 I get a surrender design and some anticipating what. Yeah, but it's certainly no worse than any other study. Yeah. yeah. This is an issue for any, yeah. Yeah, yeah. any kind of study. Any right? surveillance study you would have this. I mean, it comes back, and even related to the question of data storage, I mean, so it comes back to the original questions. You know, if, you're, if you don't need to ask questions three times a day, every day for a week, you know, and you're going to aggregate it over yeah, right. you know, a month then, you know, to get a measure, then you really need that amount of data. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. you're just going to drive people crazy and spend and, and burn servers, you know, burn server uh, space. So. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, uh, barriers to, uh, to adherence. Uh, you know, many of them are, are, are similar. By adherence, I mean actually continuing to fill out the, the questionnaires. Uh, privacy concerns are there, and particularly for low SES groups, we found those more uh, more prominent. Um, uh, uh, changes to device, um, so they've they've changed the uh, uh, the device, and they're they're um, they're they're not uh, active with the new device. Too busy looking at questionnaires, so they're you know the questionnaire comes up, they're notified of it, but they don't look at it. Maybe they're writing an email message and. You know, it, it interrupts them, and they want to get back to their email, and they forget that it's there. Um, um, questionnaire appears too long. That's my, my, I've, I've, I've uh, lapsed in my Queen's English. Um, the questionnaire appears too burdensome. Right, uh, uh, looking at it, it seems overwhelming. Um, battery exhaustion. So, the the data quality is impaired because it's truncated because of short battery life. This used to be a much bigger issue these days. I'm not sure, uh, Mohammed, are you seeing, uh, uh, is, this, is this remaining a, a sort of point of, of uh, ongoing concern for you, battery exhaustion? No, it's, no, it's, it's, uh, th there it's are, like a third order issue now. Yeah, th there yeah. are, well, there are more push for uh, the, the more rigorous data collection that, that, that can make this an issue again. Like for example, right sure. now we are, talking about increasing the frequency from uh, once every five minutes to once every minute uh, right. for GPS recording. Right. And uh, how that works out, that's one of the, the concerns. But yeah. at, at the current setting, no, it's not an issue because it's once every five minutes, so it works yeah. acceptably. Yeah. But as we increase it, we have to again reevaluate things. And even with, with audio, uh, like the ambient audio streams, yeah, with the ambient audio uh, yeah. stream. Because I think in the ambient audio we record, uh, what was that? Like five minutes every half an hour, 10 minutes I per see. hour. I see. Okay. So. That doesn't benefit. Yeah, that's sampling five minutes per half an hour. Sure. It's not that. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Um, and then phone failures also used to be more of an issue. It, it, it does occasionally happen for sure, but uh, you know, loss of phone. Um, uh, Mohammed, did you say it, it, one fell into the river or something? Yeah, well, that was actually one of these low SES uh, participants, which well, I was surprised. It was a very fancy phone. It was Samsung Galaxy S7, uh, I think, mm -hmm. that fell in the river. It's like, oh my god, I can save it. <laughs> <laughs> you had one thrown across the room, right? Yeah. I went thrown across the room by a friend that thought it was her boyfriend's phone. Smashed, like, completely <laughs> obliterated. The back story, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the other great story about how phones have been destroyed, I think the, the best one I've heard is from my, my daughter, my um, sister-in-law, who has a three-year-old child, who presented her mother with a, gris a Christmas present around Christmas, where she'd gone and found her brand new iPhone 6, and they put it in the Ziploc bag, and they then filled that Ziploc bag with um, liquid soap <laughs> and presented it to mum, you know. Merry Christmas, mummy, you know. <laughs> was, you know, brilliant in its kind of maliciousness, isn't it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting it clean for you. Yeah, yeah. it's right. yeah. pretty and green and blue. Um. <laughs> I, would, I would put um, firmware incompatibility. It's becoming more and more rare. But I did notice the latest one we ran. There's some strange Huawei oh, yeah. phone I've never heard of that has only reported 15% of uh, possible data. And I strongly suspect that's because there's some no, I'm familiar with that. incompatibility you know, between Ethica and that's, this phone that's causing Ethica to crash. That's uh, well, that's a good point. I know we should, if there's one Huawei, one Sony, four LGs. Uh, the challenge with Android is that every phone is different. I mentioned it that the carriers uh, like uh, OEMs uh, have their own uh, version of Android that is delivered. Yeah. Now, one of the issues we have right now that's like basically has been my concern since yesterday morning was uh, my <laughs> personal. Oh. No, it's, well, the, the concerns we have is that apparently, um, so cell phone providers can. Uh, talk to these uh, uh, manufacturers to uh, 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 like basically provide them with their custom phone. And one of them is uh, some brand of LG called LG K7, which is very popular for uh, uh, Metro PCS uh, uh, subscribers. This is a very it's a very cheap phone. Uh, so I think it's less than hundred dollars unlocked. Now, the problem we have there is that our app on a specific type of phone only GPS works and every other stream source of data stops working. That's why when you get a report, it thinks, well, we didn't, we didn't provide any of the data on GPS, so that's why the uh, yeah. uh, percentage is so low. Now, we can't even buy that phone here in Canada. We have to actually order it from US, and they don't ship it here. So we were, we were, we were having like half an hour talk yesterday that how we can get that phone here as fast as possible. Now, I will get one of those phones I think by August 24th, that was the earliest we could get our hands mm -hmm. on to that. So uh, that's the same problem yeah. that we have four LGs, one Huawei, and one Sony. Uh, that there are failures like this happening, and uh, we only pray that there are not as many people using those phones. <laughs> yeah, and, and the deal is once Mohammed physically gets a an instance of that phone, that's that's really what allows the diagnosis yeah. to go on as to what the issue is, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this is not an issue for iPhones, is that right? Because it's all it's no, standard. It's just one comp iPhone one has comp a whole other set of issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, iPhone has other issues. Yeah, but, the, but this is not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, study study staff. Um, I mentioned earlier that. Some familiarity with smartphone platforms being used for a given study, um, uh, and and uh, you know enough comfort with with using said phones um, is required for interfacing with with some participants, and particularly during the consent process, troubleshooting requests, um, uh, sleuthing down barriers to non-reporting or interaction with the website, um, it's valuable to have uh, study team members who, who have at least uh, some basic comfort online with, with, with uh, browsers, feel com really comfortable with apps, 
and uh, you know with smartphones, um, and uh, you know as as studies go increasingly to supporting iPhone and Android, this means you know having familiarity with both types and and. By and large, we haven't found this a big issue, but there have been, there has been at least one case that, that I have in mind, actually two cases where this has been a bit of an issue. I think in both cases, there was education that went on during the time, but it led to a lot of spurious complaints, let's just put it that way, by, by the study staff about issues that they, they erroneously imputed to be an issue with uh, with Ethica, and you know what we finally resolved, and what was really really helpful was to have videos recorded. So they used a, a separate device to record a video of the malfunctioning phone, and supposedly while Ethica was malfunctioning, <laughs> and the video clearly demonstrated. It took about. No, uh, less than a minute for Mohammed to immediately recognize it. No, the phone here is clearly just not connected to the internet. So they were trying to opt into a study while the phone was just not not on a network, for example. Um, or you know, they were trying to update the application from Google Play Store when the phone was not connected. And um, they were they were getting all tied up in knots about you know Ethica software being buggy or what have you, where it had nothing to do with Ethica. I mean, Ethica wasn't even on it for some of these things. It was just that they didn't know how to connect an Android phone to a network in a reliable fashion, or it was timing out on the network because they were using you, you know, the institutional network for guests rather than for for secure, um, you know, for long-term connections. And and um, it, it caused a lot more grief and misconceptions. Than it should have, and and I would hold up Amin and uh, and uh, Mohammed as sort of uh, particularly bearing with the difficult situation in a in an admirable fashion. Um, so uh, so I salute you too um, for your stalwart uh, efforts. Um, but uh, the point is, you it's not true that you want. Um, that that the study facing people can be totally devoid of, of sort of computer familiarity. You want at least passing familiarity, or at least some measure of comfort and familiarity with the phone models and with browsing online, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, you know, similarly with interacting with the website, you've seen what the website is like, and just understanding how the menus work and how to navigate to the certain place and and you know how to get this certain type of information. It's pretty important for monitoring ongoing, ongoing information. Okay, so uh, strong interpersonal skills um, uh, are very important, but some measure of computational uh, comfort is is also uh, really really valuable. Um, and um, you know, I, I do think it's valuable to have uh, mixed teams, but what you don't want is um, is a situation where all the all the contact with participants um, is is going on by someone who's not uh, who doesn't have basic levels of, of comfort, um, and the technical people are one step removed from that. You either want to have the the computationally technical people um, present for some of the interactions. Or better yet, you want to you want to build some basic strengths on the part of the uh, of the team members from the health science side that uh, that interface with participants. So study staff needs. Uh, Kevin and, and Mohammed, do you have other comments you want to make along these lines? Local mixed teams. That's, yes. <laughs> yeah. Local is key. Yeah. It's not merely Mohammed in Toronto. It's, it's, it's having people locally that can walk over, look at the situation, comment on it, et cetera. Um, uh, remote contacts are still a, a pale cipher compared to, to in-person um, interactions. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments, Mohammed, from your, your experience? Um, 
Okay, user side issues. Um, you mentioned privacy as a as a, a substantive issue. Um, uh, again, people vary widely in their sensitivity on the privacy front. Um, and I'm trying to remember, do I have a, um, no, I don't have a, a slide specifically, and I, I should, um, on sort of issues having to do with uh, concerns about privacy and confidentiality on the part of participants. Um, uh, if it's a barrier, it's tended to be a barrier at time of recruitment, I've, I found, rather than a time of continued participation. And you could think of that as the selection process. The people who opt in are ones who, who have some degree of comfort. Sometimes it does impair participation. So the snooze button on Ethica, which had a corresponding function within the previous versions of IEPI, um, that has tended to be used extremely little. Mohammed, do you have any statistics on snooze button use for recent studies? Off the top of your head? No, I, we, I, I have never heard anyone saying that they have used it, and I honestly haven't searched for it. Like, we have the data, but I have never really looked into it. Yeah. But I, my sense is the same as well. That's used very, very little, if any. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, some, some folks have seen the snooze button, some partners, and have said, oh man, that's gonna, that could really cut down our amount of data. Do we really want to give them the ability to opt out on the fly? And I think it's actually extremely important for lending a sense of comfort for participants, but empirically they don't seem to use it in any, to, to, to a large degree. Now there was, there, there are two notable exceptions that I'm thinking about. There's one study that we conducted predominantly among low SES individuals using the previous version of, of Ethica, excuse me, of IEPI. And, um, and there was one individual who snoozed the phone of the time that it was recording any data, of the time it was on. They snoozed it something like between 50 to 70 percent of the time, which takes some doing. And it takes a lot of effort to snooze it in this way. Now that version of, of IEPI, um, you actually would press snooze and it would add to the amount we would add 30 minutes, so you do, you know, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, and just press them, keep on pressing it. And evidently this, this uh, individual, and it was, it was a woman, it was a study of gestational diabetes, um, you know, evidently she would, you know, be very careful about making it snooze. And um, that, that was unusual. Um, we, we lost a large fraction of data from her. And there was another individual from that same study for whom we lost somewhere like 10% or 20% of their data through snoozing. So it's not that there's never been an issue, but I, I think it, it's a very, very small amount. And I, I would easily go out there and conjecture that if we looked at the latest statistics, it would be less than 1% of data we lose. And at the same time, it plays an extremely important role, I think, in, in lending people confidence that this is not, you know, not a malicious big brother that's going to be constantly watching them and, and their, you know, their privacy is being violated. It, it lends some comfort that they're in control of the situation. Lends a sense of control about their privacy on an ongoing basis. That's, that's important. Um, um, there are misunderstandings, and this brings home the need for education, right, Mohammed? You were talking about this participant in a recent study, I think you were trying to reach that person this morning on the phone or something, even, but, but this participant who had concerns about Bluetooth. Yes, yes. And, and they, yeah. they were concerned that by having Bluetooth enabled, it would, it would uh, sort of betray their contact patterns to anyone, or, or at least that, that it would be very visible, their contact patterns. They they would be, they were think, she was thinking that she would be visible, her presence would be visible to other people in the area. I don't know how that works, but, but that's what she was saying. She was saying that if she leaves the Bluetooth on, other people other are going to know she's, notice she's there. And I was thinking, but they can probably see you that you're there. So Well, it's more the, so some stores have started recording Wi-Fi and Bluetooth contacts. 
Uh, she wasn't worried about the ID, the Mac has been recorded. She was recorded. She was worried about that the name of her device being recorded. Probably, I suggest. Well, I I was going to suggest her just to change the name of your device, and then you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, with these these technical yeah. issues. Yeah. And actually, I'm not. I mean, the original versions of IEP did not, based on ethics feedback, we did not record that. And that was actually uh, an early course correction, because there was the first yeah. study we ran, we actually did record that, and, and there was a concern raised, and we changed it, yeah. so that it no longer recorded that. So if it said Dave's phone, it would not be recorded. And, and we could tell participants, does Ethica currently record blue, uh, sort of Bluetooth names of we, devices? We record the Bluetooth name as well, and that's been always included. I don't think it was ever raised as an issue, here they raise an issue not for us seeing the name of that device, right. but for other, other people. Yeah. people seeing the name of the device. I'm not sure if she was really sure about the, the difference between name and MAC address, yeah. but she was generally concerned about her Bluetooth being visible to other devices. Right. Speaking from an ethics standpoint, it's not so much uh, this participants as well, but also non participants. So it, right. it becomes, it basically creates a data stream de-identification as possible. Yeah, but but if, uh, well, we, we discussed the, to, to some extent the sensors that Bluetooth is actually just like it, it's one of those streams that's right now in the verge of changing yeah. uh, uh, considerably because of the way that they want to protect the uh, the privacy and the name is not as important. The I, IP is a lot more important for request. The, the MAC address is a lot more important for uh, tracing them. That's why most of the like the latest version of Android and iPhone both they uh, they generate a random MAC address every time you restart your phone. So your phone's identity changes. Your the name stays the same, but uh, the name also uh, it doesn't say uh, as much. Uh, and I think people if they keep their Bluetooth on, probably they were. Uh, they decided to keep that name on and visible to others. The Mac has is more of an issue in Bluetooth in general, but either way, this is not going to work in future, and we have to switch to using beacons, and beacons just have Mac address anyway. So, so, so but the overall idea. point here is that there are perceptions sometimes about pro privacy that could be amenable to discussion and education about understanding how these technologies work. Another, another concern that had come up in one discussion, this is some time ago, but was, um, you know, is Ethica going to be listening, it's actually the previous version by Epi, I think, um, is, is it going to be listening to all my conversations? You know, is it going to be recording everything I say, for example? That, that's another concern, this kind of this notion that it's, it's going to be monitoring me and in all aspects of my behavior, maybe it'll be listening in on what I'm saying as well. And you know, we had to ensure that it was not, but it brings home the importance of an understandable consent process. Yeah. Understandable consent documentation and in a possible discussion when there are these uh, concerns. Um, um, so those are uh, some sort of high level uh, I love considerations. Um, in terms of, on an ongoing basis, when you're running a study, um, both for these reasons and for others, there's a need to monitor over time um, what is going on. And, and if possible, to do that very frequently. I mean, an ideal situation of daily, you can monitor how people are responding to the study. Um, you know, what, what sort of response are we getting? Is there someone who has gone several days without responding? Um, it start looking into it, and um, and currently the the mechanisms for doing this are um, are, are limited, but um, uh, but are provided. We saw some of them uh, before here. Um, not sure if I'm uh, properly online here, but uh, this is Ethica here. Um, and uh, I would just note that with these sample studies, and I would invite you to go to the, um, to the Ethica website right now. Um, we, we had explored some of the sample studies before, and I'd call your attention to this physical activity sample study. Um, 
Uh, there's a couple, okay, uh, great. Um, uh, let me see if I can get connected here. Um, uh, maybe what I will do is to um, switch over to this guy here, because um, I could uh, easily record it there. And um, the Wi-Fi has been flaking it, but it, so if you just open it, it has the browser, been. Yeah. Okay. Um, reconnect. Uh, okay. So. Uh, give me a second here. Um, okay. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll go via the the Ethernet cable here. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. I think I'll, I'll do the switch over. Okay. Um, so uh, in, in Ethica system, there's, um, uh, there's a couple of different ways that uh, we can monitor a compliance. And I'm going to just walk you through uh, several of them here, OK? Um, so uh, uh, one of them is uh, on the dashboard. So if you go to that study and you look at this dashboard that I just started uh, uh, started paying attention to. Um, what you should see is uh, information on participants. So it's a participants tab and you should be able to um, go uh, in that participants area in order to see uh, statistics on on the last time uh, or see information on the last time that a given participant was uh, seen. Information on um, that, that might be germane to sort of uh, uh, to checking in with them and figuring out if um, uh, if they are uh, if there's some barrier to their participation. Okay, so I'm just going to do this. This is sort of uh, uh, adherence uh, related um, um, Ethica website uh, info. Okay, so uh, I'm going to record this here. And I'm going to switch over to this as my um, uh, as my uh, connector here. I'm going to disconnect from this. Okay. Um, right. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the extended desktop here, here, and here. Great. And uh, and. Here we go. This will be recorded. Okay. Um, there we go. And I'm going to stop recording over here just so we don't get a bunch of um, stuff that's not really um, 